If you have God's Word, if you would turn with me to 2 Corinthians. And we're going to start in chapter 3, verse 18. But the focus of our text is going to be in chapter 4. If you remember last Sunday night, we were talking about, uh, Paul is talking about this great ministry that he has received from the Lord. And he talks about us be, being ministers of a new covenant versus the old covenant. And you remember he used the illustration of Moses, who's, when he went up to get the Ten Commandments, his face shone with the glory of God. And they would put a veil on his face so the people couldn't tell the glory was fading away. And Paul's point is, if the Old Covenant came with such glory, what more glory will the New Covenant have? And so, as he finishes up that discussion in verse, chapter 3, verse 18, he writes, And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. What image? The image of Christ. We are being transformed into the same image, the image of Christ, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful and underhanded ways. You remember the, those who were attacking Paul were using underhanded ways to get people's attention and to call into question what Paul was doing. But he says, we don't use those ways. We refuse, going on in, a chapter, in verse 2, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word. But by the open statement of the truth... We would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake, for Jesus' sake. In verse 6, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we come with joyful hearts to seek your face this night. Lord, I know how you've burdened my heart with this message. And I know your people need to hear it. Father, all of us in this place need to hear it. And Father, I pray that, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would make these words come alive in our hearts, that we might be able to understand, Lord, what you need to say to us. And Lord, may your glory and your power be seen in this place, through this message, to your honor and to your glory. And Lord, I pray that and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In John chapter 3, there is a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus knows the rules. He knows the law. He's lived his entire life according to the old covenant. But in Jesus Christ, he sees something that is different. He sees something that he's missing in his own life. 
And so as he comes to Jesus Christ, Jesus says to him, Nicodemus, truly, truly, of most utmost certainty is what Jesus is saying. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see or participate in the kingdom of God. Nicodemus needed to understand that the new birth is the work of the Holy Spirit of the living God that takes place in the life of a person. Paul wrote the 2 Corinthians to deal with some false teachers whom he dubbed super apostles. These super apostles, these super apostles had succeeded in tearing down the church, convincing them that Paul was not a worthy pastor, partly because he had suffered persecution for the gospel, partly because he was never there, partly because he was not a great, cre a great preacher, partly just because, just because they wanted to stir things up and they wanted these Christian believers whose lives had been transformed by the power of the gospel to turn back to the law. And it was breaking Paul's heart. Paul wrote and speaks very clearly in this fourth, fourth chapter what it means to be a minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice first of all, the character of the minister. The character of the minister. Paul indicates in this particular passage, we have this ministry by the mercy of God. It wasn't Paul's ministry. Paul didn't invent this. He didn't simply show up in Corinth with great eloquence of speech to be able to change the hearts and minds of people. It was the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. God had shined His light in our hearts and in the, in the hearts of those there that the light of the glory of God could be seen in the face of Jesus. And Paul goes on to say, we don't proclaim ourselves but Jesus as Lord. A person who has seen the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ lays down his or her life in service to the King of kings and Lord of lords. When Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple, you remember what happened? When he saw that and when he saw the discussion that was taking place in heaven, what he said was, Lord, here am I, send me. When Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he saw the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that glory was so bright, it was brighter than the noonday sun. And it literally blinded the mind or blinded the eyes of the Apostle Paul. Several days later, God sent a man, spoke to a man named Ananias, a man who loved the Lord, and spoke to that man named Ananias and said, Ananias, I want you to go lay hands on him. And pray for him that he can, might receive his sight. And you know what Ananias said? Lord, you don't know that guy like I do. <laughs> I've heard about him. He's creating havoc all over the world. And you know what Paul, God's response was to Ananias? He said, go, Ananias, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Folks, when you and I talk about the ministry, we typically refer to somebody who's been called of God to preach. That's typically what we say. But here's what we need to understand. When a person has been changed by the power of the living God, when the Holy Spirit of the living God makes you be born again unto salvation, we all become a minister of the gospel. We cease serving our own purposes. We are brought into God's purpose. We no longer live aimless lives. We are called into God's purposes so that we can proclaim His glory to all the nations. We who have seen God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ are called to proclaim God's glory to a lost and dying world. Peter says over in 1 Peter 2, 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous life. What have we received? We've received the Lord Jesus Christ. We who were dead in our trespasses and sin, 
We who were going our own way, doing our own thing, the Bible says that Jesus Christ comes into our life to make us alive unto God. He brings us from death unto life. God has shined His light into our heart, into our darkened soul, and He's dispelled the darkness. He has brought life out of deadness. Have you looked at the face of Jesus Christ? Have you seen the glory of God in Jesus? All that God has chosen to reveal about Himself is revealed in Jesus Christ. You know what the Word of God says? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he goes on to talk about that Word. And what does he say down in verse 14 of John chapter 1? And the Word became flesh. And we beheld His glory. Glory as of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. Jesus said, if, you, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Do you want to see God's glory? It is most clearly revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews says, God has spoken in, in many ways and in many forms in days past. But in these last days, He has spoken to us through His Son. Jesus Christ reveals to us who God is. When you and I look into the face of Jesus Christ, do you see Him? Do you see the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you see the one who healed the sick, who raised the dead, who spoke to the winds and caused them to cease, who told the sea to be still and the sea was still? He looked at demons and he told them to flee and they obeyed his voice. Why? Because he was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He was the Lord of glory. Have you gazed at the face of Jesus and recognized his lordship? Folks, he is Lord over all creation, which includes us. When God causes His light to shine on us and we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, our lives are changed. Our lives are radically changed. I believe, honestly, if we would truly gaze in the face of Jesus every day, we would be different. We would pursue God with everything within us. We would be more diligent in living a godly life. We would be more careful in our speech. We would be more faithful in coming to God's house where we can serve Him and we can hear what He needs to say to us. As someone stated, there would be about us the marks of men or, and women, I would say, who have met God in the glory and in the face of Jesus Christ and all of His greatness. And this would take the lightness and the superficiality out of our living. Folks, too many Christians today simply go through the motions. We're living lives, defeated lives, when we have seen the glory of God in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus accused the church at Ephesus of having left their first love. That's part of the problem of this church here at Corinth. They'd left their first love. They were following men. They were following different leaders. They were not following the Lord Jesus Christ. They were following people. They had left their first love. Has something happened to cure your passionate love for Jesus? Think about that just a minute. Someone has rightly stated all affection dies if it's not nourished. Think about marriage relationships. How many, how many marriages do you know that have fallen apart because the love, the passion, the flame has gone out. Folks, God calls upon us to be in love with Him. If you've lost the white hot flame of the love, your love for the Lord Jesus Christ, you're in trouble. You're in deep trouble. Jesus, you remember what Jesus said to the church at Ephesus? If you don't return to your first love, if you don't repent... I'm going to take your right to exist as a church. I'm just going to remove it. You won't even get a chance to exist anymore. Folks, that's the bride of Christ. That, that's who Jesus is preparing to come back for one of these days. And you and I are a part of that bride. If God is going to, like, going to let His bride get away with that, do you think He's going to let His children get away with that? Folks, you and I have seen God God has shined His light into our lives. He has brought us from death unto life. He's made us a new creation in Christ Jesus. 
Have you seen the glory of God in the face of Jesus? If you have, you'll never be the same again. Your lives will be so radically changed that you won't be able to keep quiet about Jesus. You'll talk about Him everywhere, every place. You'll live for Jesus. You won't live for yourself. You'll live so that His glory might be seen among the nations. If your love has grown cold, you need to repent of your backslidden condition because you are most definitely backslidden if you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. Notice the second part. Not only the character of the minister. Notice the communication of this ministry. Paul writes, For we preach or proclaim not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord or the Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. I guarantee you those false apostles that were there, it wasn't about Jesus. It's nothing about Jesus. It was about them. It was about them getting paid for being the eloquent speakers that they were. It was about them discrediting the Apostle Paul and the leaders that God had placed over that church so that they could, the glory could be focused on them. Folks, when you and I get saved, just like the Apostle Paul, we get saved not for our personal enjoyment, not for our edification, but that Christ might be made known among all peoples. Folks, this world is coming to an end one of these days. And every person that does not put their faith and trust in Jesus will spend eternity in hell. Where the flame dieth not and the worm is never quenched. People live for all eternity with the knowledge that they could have been saved. How many of those will be there because you and I didn't live out the radical call of Jesus Christ in our life? We wanted just to get enough Jesus in us so that we didn't go to hell. But we really didn't want to live out. The communication of this ministry is all about Jesus. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Folks, you belong to Jesus when, when you've been saved. You belong to Him. Your life is dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. You and I are dead to self, but alive to God. Folks, when Jesus comes into our life, it's not just for us to communicate the Lord Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. You've got to get over yourself. I'm going to use today's terminology. You just need to get over yourself. It's not about you. It's about God. It's about His kingdom. Too many Christians suffer and, unha and are un unhappy. And some even create havoc in God's church because they don't get what they want. They are too concerned with exalting themselves. The exaltation is the principle of life by which the world lives, not Christians. You and I have been brought into the purposes of God. Self and God cannot share the throne of your life. Jesus cannot be Lord of your life if you still want to be in charge of it and in control of it. Jesus said, my glory I will not give to another. God is never going to share His glory. One of the, the very first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That includes yourself. And that's the biggest God we all have, isn't it? We all want ourself. If we don't get what we want when we come to church, well, they don't sing the music I like, or they don't preach like I like to be preached to. They, they step, that preacher steps on my toes and doesn't even tell me where my steel-toed shoes The principle of this world is summed up in one song. And I heard the name of it this week. I did it my way. I did it my way. Isn't that what the way the world lives? I did what I want to do however I want to do it. But that's not, that's not God's way, folks. That's not the life of a Christian. We are not to proclaim ourselves, folks, but Jesus Christ is Lord. If we are clamoring for attention and clamoring for our ways and what we want, we are not proclaiming the Lordship of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. 
Paul says in Colossians chapter 3 that you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul's self was crucified, and that's the thing. The only hope for this spiritually dark, bankrupt world is that the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ might be made known. Jesus humbled himself to do the will of his Father, which was to die on the cross, that we might be reconciled to God. Are we willing to allow the King of kings and the King of the universe to occupy the throne of our lives so that God's glory can be seen in this world? So that God's glory can be evident to a lost and dying humanity. It's a question I think we all need to ask ourselves. The communication of the ministry is not about us, folks. It's about Jesus. The third thing I want you to see in this passage is the cost of that communication. Look with me begin in verse 7 if you still have your Bible open. I'm going to read to you from the J.B. Phillips translation. Listen to what he says. This priceless treasure, what's the treasure? It's Jesus, isn't it? The priceless treasure is Jesus. This priceless treasure we hold, so to speak, in a common earthenware jar to show that the splendid power of it belongs to God and not to us. We are handicapped on all sides, but we're never frustrated. We are puzzled, but never in despair. We are persecuted, but we never have to stand it alone. We're knocked down, but we're never knocked out. I like that. Every day we experience something of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ so that we may also know the power of life, of the power of the life of Jesus in these bodies of ours. We are always facing death, but this means that you know more and more of life, God's kind of life. The price we have to pay to communicate the glory and the plan of God in the face of Jesus is costly. It's costly because it is totally contrary to the principle by which everyone else lives. The world's principle is self-glorification. Christ, the Christian principle that we live by is self-crucifixion. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow after me. Folks, that's not the way the world lives. And you and I are not called to live the way the world lives. We're not called to live according to the world's standards. Those who live according to the world's standards call attention to themselves, while those who live according to the Christian principle seek to die to self every day. One person commenting on this says, The principle of men is greatness, bigness, pomp, and show. The principle of the cross is death. Therefore, whenever a man has seen the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and recognizing, recognizes that this is for communication, at once he comes into a head-on collision with his own personal living, with all of his principle and motives upon which he has lived up until that moment. If the glory of God, folks, in the face of Jesus is to be seen in this world, we must constantly submit ourselves to death. We must constantly deny what we want. We must constantly deny our preferences so that the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ can be seen in this world. So that people might come to know who God is. So that people can get radically saved and have their lives too changed by the power of God. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6 verse 11, you must also consider or I like the word the King James uses there, reckon yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. The word reckon, Ms. Debbie, you'll like this, the word reckon is a balance sheet term. It's talking about the bottom line. What Paul is saying in that verse of Scripture in Romans chapter 11, the bottom line is this, you're dead. And you must consider yourself dead to yourself every day, every moment of every day. And whenever yourself raises its head and says, but I won't, say, get out of here. Get behind me, Satan, because that's not of God. 
You have been bought with a price so that you might glorify God in your bodies. Folks, the cost of Christian life is not found in, in giving up going to the movies or giving up watching programs on TV or giving up tobacco or giving up alcohol or giving up drugs. In order to communicate the glory of God in the face of Jesus, deep down in the soul of every Christian for all times and all ways, we must say no to every demand of our flesh. Everything that we want must be brought under submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When you come around Christian people, do you see the glory of God in the face of Jesus evident in their life? Folks, we ought to. We ought to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ every time we come together with God's people. People ought to see the glory of God in us because of what Jesus Christ has done. We are a chosen race that we might proclaim the excellencies, the superiority, the glory of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to a lost and dying world. Why do so many Christians live defeated lives? Why do so many Christians never lead one person to faith in Jesus? Or to put it the way somebody says, why is it so many Christians behave like kindergarten children? It's because we haven't died to self, folks. It's because we're not letting the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ shine in and through our life every day. A person who's been born again by the power of God, as Jesus said, unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God, much less enter it. A person who's been born again experiences the freshness of life, the freshness of God in his or her own soul continually. It's a freshness of thinking. It's a freshness of talking. It's a freshness of living. We are being transformed into the image of Christ. As Paul says here in verse 18 of chapter 3, we all with unveiled face. We don't have to put a veil on our face. We are able to look into the glory of the Lord. And we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Folks, the Holy Spirit does that in our lives. That's what it means to be born again by the power of the living God. If you're experiencing staleness in your life, it's because something's out of joint with God. You're not where you need to be. That means self has raised its ugly head again. And you need to remember to reckon yourself dead to sin, but alive to God. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if you haven't seen the glory of God in the face of Jesus, that's my desire for you this year. That's my desire for you every day. That you would see the glory of God in the face of Jesus because it will radically transform your life and people will notice. If we would radically live out the call of the Lord Jesus Christ, the ministry that He's called us to, the ministry of proclaiming His glory to the nations, to every person, people would sit up and take notice. We'd have to start knocking the walls out of this place because people would start getting saved and coming to Jesus. My dear brothers and sisters, don't just go through life. Don't just waste mark time on a calendar. Life's too short. God's glory is of supreme importance. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only person that can change another's life live out his glory to the honor and the praise and the adoration of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would you bow with me in prayer Father as we come to a sacred time of invitation Lord I know that your Holy Spirit has been speaking to our hearts Lord I know that our self continually says to us Oh, that's just really nonsense. We don't need to pay attention to that. You don't need, you know, you're saved. You don't need to worry about living out the glory of Christ in your life. But Father, your spirit whispers in that still small voice and calls for us to reckon ourselves dead to sin but alive to God. Oh, Father, don't let this opportunity pass without us doing business with you tonight. And Lord, I pray that and I ask it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you've been set aside for God's purposes. What does that look like in your life? Do you know? We talked this morning about finding your spiritual giftedness and living out that in your life. Are you completing the ministry that God has called you to do? Are you letting the glory of Christ rapture your soul and shine out through your life each and every day? You know you can do that. Not in your own strength, not in your own power. The Holy Spirit of the living God has to come in and transform your life from glory to glory. That's what that passage in Paul says. We're being transformed. As we gaze into the face of Christ, we're being transformed just a little bit every time from glory to glory. Isn't that what you want for your life? Isn't that what you want to be and do? Folks, the most joyful place to be is in the very center of God's will. Don't let this world drag you down. Don't let this world get, take you, help you take your eyes off Jesus. Forget clamoring for your own rights. You've been bought with a price. Glorify God in your life and in your body. Is there a decision you need to make here tonight? Do you need to rededicate your life? What is it God is asking you to do? Will you honor Him tonight? Just a minute, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. I want you to do what God is asking you to do. And let me say this. If you don't have a personal relationship to Jesus Christ, you can, not because of who you are, not because of anything you've done, but because of the Lord Jesus Christ loved you enough that He was willing to take your place at the cross. He was willing to die for the punishment of your sins so that you don't have to be punished by God. What greater love has anybody had than that? That they would love you like that. You know, you can join every church in this country and you can be dunked in water a thousand times. But unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Today is God's day of salvation. If you don't know Christ, come. Invite Christ into your life. Be born again and experience the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Let's stand together, Adam.